So for our next talk, we're very happy to have Quentin Bonifoy here to tell us about uh, string defects and the funk web. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Thanks a lot to, to Cody and John for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, uh, what I will be discussing is based on, on this paper together with Carlo and Antoni, Cesar Kondescu and Emilian Dudas, and it will have to do with the string defects, supersymmetry, and the swamp plant. So probably in front of this audience, I don't need to say much about the swamp plant, but so the swamp plant program aims at constraining effective field theories from quantum gravities, and this goes beyond the case of anomalies, anomaly cancellation or unitarity constraints. And the result, well, the result of this program so far has been a set of remarkably interconnected conjectures. And of course, one question is how can we how can we strength, strengthen the impact of these one-point conjectures? How can we go, go closer to the boundaries of the landscape here? Yeah? And here in this talk, I will discuss two, two ways of doing it. First, which one, one which is to extend the reach of the swamp point criteria by adding new conjecture. And the other, one, the other one would be to refine existing conjecture. And this I will have in mind particularly string theory tests with supersymmetry breaking, which has not been the main focus, I think, of the, of the, the swamp point literature. And I will discuss a very specific approach actually, which has have been pioneered, has been pioneered by Kim, Xu, and Vafa roughly two years ago. And they, in this paper, they ruled out some super, super gravity EFTs using anomalies in a refined way that I will make more precise in a few slides. The basic idea is to use the completeness of the gauge spectrum and, and study the consistency of the charge states, which are predicted by this principle, this completeness principle. So here in the super gravities, you have uh, P-form gauge fields, and then you predict extended objects charged under those P-forms. And, and, and the anomaly concentration on those objects yields some constraints on the model EFT. It's, 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 it's a very powerful idea, actually, because, for instance, it has been used to motivate the string lamp post principle. Um, so the idea that everything that could be found in the landscape can actually be found in the string landscape. And something I like about it is that it's a statement about the deep IR. Namely, you cannot, I think you cannot escape it by just adding some heavy matter, even at a reasonable, reasonably low scale. Once you know the, the massless degrees of freedom, you can already make the claim. So let me describe in detail what that, how, how this works. So let me describe the consistency of string defects from anomaly inflow. So I will follow the logic of this paper, Kim Shu and Bafa, and I will collectively, collectively refer as, to, to these authors as being KSV in what follows. So they, they studied originally 10D and 6D theories for which you have a strong constraint from anomaly cancellation due to the gravitation, presence of gravitational anomalies in addition to gauge anomalies. And, and in those, and they studied the theories with the minimal amount of, of supersymmetry. In, and in, in such theories, you can have anomaly cancellation and like gain Schwartz and also extended to by Sanyoti to, to, to type two compactification to 6D. The idea here is that you can have a non-vanishing anomaly polynomial from the, the Carroll spectrum of the theory. Uh, as long as it, fa it factorizes as a product of two, of two lower degree form. And then if it, if, if it factorizes in this way, you can add to the, to the action a classical coupling of a two form to, to these four forms. And if you give to the two forms uh, the, the correct transformation um, under, under different morphisms or gauge transformations, then the classical shift of this piece will undo the quantum shift due to the anomaly. And so that's good. That's a well-known story in, in, in string compactification, which is realized in string compactification, for instance, in 6D. And, and, but here now, if you add the requirement that the gauge spectrum has to be complete, then you, you, you predict that there exist charged string defects that couple to the, to the two form C, to, to the set of two forms C2 here. I should say that here there is a, some number of two forms in this theory. So for instance, in type two, you can have several of them which are coupled using this effective metric. Yeah? So, and under the gauge, the, the gauge, uh, well, each, each defect can couple to this gauge field with a charge uh, Q like that. And, and now due to the fact that the, the two form is charged and there are different morphism and, 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 gauge, and gauge, gauge symmetries, uh, this term will, will now shift and induce an anomaly inflow on the defect, on the string defect. So in particular, this coupling will induce a four, a, a four form anomaly polynomial of this form determined by the 6D anomaly polynomial in the charge of the string. 
And then the question is, can can what are there con well, what kind of degrees of freedom on the on the string can exist to possibly cancel this this inflow? And it turns out that these these uh, CFTs are, are heavily constrained and, and in turn can constrain the 6D. Well, here we focus on 6D, the 6D theory original, the original 6D theory. So if you look at those conditions for one half BPS string effects that they take the form on condition, uh, well, they take the following forms, where, where you see the charge of the, of the string here, all contractions are here, this dot is made with this, uh, sorry, with this um, metric omega that we already encountered. And these vectors are A and B parameterize this uh, four form here, which was the square root of the 60 anomaly polynomial. So they appear here. You also have a, a Kähler form here, which I will not discuss, which is also constrained, but I won't discuss it too much because I won't use it explicitly in the rest of the talk. So here, here, those are constrained from the, the tension of the string and, and positive and the positivity of the different central charges and cat moody level. And here, there is a unitarity constraint on the contribution to the left-handed central charge. Very good. So all all these. Uh, so so in the in, in this paper. The authors consider these couplings and, 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 and try to look for theories for which the, the most general BPS string would not would violate these conditions. And, and then consequently using the completeness hypothesis, you can rule out these theories and, and claim that they are part, part of the swamp. So this, as I said, this is what has been done. And this has been, has, has been used to rule out specific supergravities or even to bound infinite families of supergravity, which were known to be anomaly free in 6D. So most notably, there, is an ex there are two examples in 10D where, where this has been done. So there is the, the two 10D supergravity, which were not realized in, in, in string theory, namely the U1 to the 946 and 86, and the EA times U1 to the 248. And also a bunch of 6D theories, for instance, an, an infinite family of, of SUN times SUN gauge groups coupled to nine tensors and, and two by phenomenon tensors. There was also this interesting paper which took, which took, a, took a look at uh, abelian, abelian gauge fields in such theories in 6D. Good. Okay, so that was the review of, of this uh, KSV approach. Now I'd like to discuss uh, some tests of this approach that we performed in perturbative 6D or antifold models. So, and here we'll start with the, with the simplest case of a supersymmetric model. And uh, actually, I will take a very, I will just stick to a very simple example, which is this uh, bianchi sanyoti gimon polchinski model. So it's a compactification of type 1 strings on T4 mod Z2. So it's, um, in terms of extended objects, it's a model of O9 and O5 planes and D9 and D9 and D5 planes. And the gauge group of, of, of this uh, combination of objects it is a U16 times U16. You also have a massless spectrum in this theory, which I, which, which, which I report here. So we, which is arranged in, in, in 6D supersymmetry multiples, so gravity tensor hypers and vectors. And so yeah, then here is the, the field contents. Here you see the, the gauge representation of the, of the open string sector. And from this, you can just compute the anomaly polynomial that we discussed before. And as, as we anticipated, it does not vanish, but it takes this factorized form. So from, from this form, you can read off the, the vectors A and B, which appeared in, those K, in the KSV constraints. Um, and you could, for instance, play the game of asking whether this model is consistent. Of course, it's a string model, so it has to be. You can just check that, that the, it passes the KSV, the KSV constraints. But what we were more interested in doing was, was to actually look at the string defects that, that are present in the theory, and, and at least that we can access perturbatively. And those were the D1 brains or the D1-like brains. So we have this background, background D9 and D5. And in addition, we can use we can in, uh, we can introduce probe brains, for instance, the, the D1 or the anti D1 or some D5, which is wrapped around the T4 here. Um, so it's it's actually this case is actually interesting because it's, it allows us by turning on magnetic fields on the D5, it allows us to create a, a full landscape of defects with different charges, for against which we can compare the KSV conditions. However, for, for the talk here, we'll simply focus on the D1 because it carries most of the information I want, to, I want to discuss. So there are two possible cases for the D1 brains that they can either be uh, localized 
at a fixed point of the orbit fold here. So whether in, here I, I will discuss fixed point in bulk and I refer to the T4 here, the orbit fold T4. So it can be either at a fixed point or it can be in the, in the bulk. So this will have an impact on the representation of this uh, of the spectrum. Well, on the spectrum that lives on this D1 brain. Here are the here are the spectra. I don't want. I mean, there's no need to look at them in detail. What's important from is that from from this spectra, we can compute the anomaly polynomial again and by just requiring that the anomaly polynomial vanishes and cancels against sorry cancels against the one that comes from the inflow. We can derive the charge of this um, of this of these two one brains. So they have the same the same charge and it, it's a two vector because they have there are two. There is one tensor in these models and, and one from the gravity multiple. So these are the charges and the, the, the tensor multiple and the tensor in the gravity map. And from this chart, we can just look at the KSB formula and we can compute the left, the left and the right-handed central chart, for instance, also the cuts moody level, which I won't show here. And you can compare it with what you get just by computing the central chart from the spectrum. And you can see that it agrees once you remove the central of mass, center of mass coordinates, which was something that KSV did already. But however, there's something interesting when you look at the D1 brain at a fixed point. In that case, um, it turns out that you, in, in addition to the, the things we just saw, so this contribution here from the center of mass coordinates, the one predicted by KSV, you have some non carol contribution to the central charges, which are of two, which have two different origin. This, this one here is due to the fact that when I look, when, when, I, when the D1 brains overlap with the D5 of the model, they are accidentally, let's say, massless states. So strings which, which stretch between the D5 and the D1, which are massless here and yield and, and add some contributions, which are non carol because they could become massless just by sending the D1 brain to the bulk. And here you have an, an, a different additional contribution that comes from the fact that this D1 brain has an increased gay group, an enlarged gay group when it sits at a fixed point. In particular, here in the bulk, it has. The single D1 brain ha had an SO1, so in an empty gauge group, whereas it has a U1 here, which is uh, which can be seen here. It has a U1 gauge group in this uh, in this case, and this this adds also new new states to to those which were taken into account in this formula. So here there's something already in interesting that shows up, which is that the those BPS brains, uh, which are the, the simple one that, that again that we can access in this perturbative model. Uh, have, have done minimal central charges. And this can raise the question whether the unitarity constraint that we presented before is too strict. In, partic in particular, you have, so it took the form of the central charge uh, bounding something which depends on the, on the, on the cuts moody levels. And, and if the central charge in, is increased, then you might have a relaxed, uh, a relaxed condition. Well, in, in this model, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's probably an academic discussion simply because those two Two charge, the two kind of brains have the same charge, so you could run a discussion using only this one, which saturates the KSV condition. But I don't know whether it's a, it's a generic expectation for SUSY models. Of course, this kind of, of breakdown, this kind of, of, of caveat were, were anticipated in the KSV paper. But since they correspond here, here in this perturbative model to simple objects, we thought it would be useful to present it in this language. Good. So now let me let me go on and discuss the model model where, where supersymmetry is broken, in particular model of the of the kind of brain supersymmetry breaking, which I will discuss in a moment. So you could ask why why would you why would you test these conditions, which were derived in supersymmetric models, assuming BPS strings? It, indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a fair question, and, and there's there's it's likely that the conditions would be modified in that case. However, our motivation, our initial motivation, was was due to the fact that the supersymmetry breaking in string theory uh, is is not completely generic. For instance, here are two examples of, of how it works. So you could have supersymmetry breaking by deformation of supersymmetric models. For instance, this happened when you break supersymmetry by compactification or using the Scherch Schwartz mechanism. In that case, you have a, a continuous parameter that you can choose that that deforms the theory away from the supersymmetric preserving points. And in that case, you expect the KSV conditions, which hold, uh, for instance, in the case of a Scherch Schwartz, if you decompactify the system, you expect them also to hold at any point in the, um, well, at any value for this compactification radius. So here is a kind of supersymmetric, supersymmetric, uh, non-supersymmetric models where you still expect some some brains to have the same spectrum as that predicted by KSV. Um, 
And, and the, the second kind of, of breaking, that, uh, which, we, which is the one I will most, mostly discuss here, is when you have a breaking at this, the string scale and like a breaking at the compactification scale here, which goes under the name of brain supersymmetry breaking. In that case, you, you superpose objects which are not necessarily BPS. And that, in that case, you expect the KSV conditions to be, to be violated simply because there's no such parameter that you can tune and send back to SUSY preserving point. But on the other hand, you, you find you can also have models where supersymmetry breaking is localized. So in that case, you, you might wonder what happens to, to defects which are separated from the supersymmetry breaking. Do they still verify KSV conditions? So, and okay, and the, the fact that supersymmetry breaking might not be fully generic in string theory is also something that has been revived, I guess, recently from the world of, of Palti, of, of Fraser, Rupert, Kriburi, and friends. Um, so, yeah, for all these reasons, we chose to be, let's say, rather naive about it and just took uh, the simplest rank supersymmetry breaking we knew and just we decided to check the KSV condition and saw where, where they, would, they would go wrong if they did. So, this, this simplest example that I mentioned, which I will discuss and focus on, is really close to the one we already saw, namely it's also a type 1 T4 mod Z2 model. However, it's made uh, the extended object in this model are different. In particular, you have an exotic O5 plane here with a positive tension and charge, with, which forces you to include anti D5 brains in the model to cancel the Ramon Ramon type form. This has the effect of changing the, the shape of the gauge group. So now the gauge group is in SO16 squared and USP16 squared. And the spectrum is also modified. So the closed strings also still lie in, in, in supersymmetric multiples. However, you have more tensors than, than the previous case where we just had a single one. And the open strings now uh, fully, fully fill the supersymmetry breaking. For instance, you see that the fields that used to be paired in a vector multiplet now uh, don't, don't lie in the same representation when it comes to the, to the anti-D5 gauge group. Okay, so from this, you can go on and still, um, and, and, and perform the same kind of steps as we discussed for the supersymmetric model. And you can compute the anomaly polynomial. So the anomaly polynomial is, is, is a bit more complicated in that case, simply because you have more tensors and also more gauge fields. However, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that this, so this sum of square, this, kind, this sum of square expression that you would like to, to see to, well, that shows you how you factorize the anomaly polynomial and allows you to read the vectors A and B, which enter the KSV condition is actually easy when you work out this model from a perturbative string setting. The, re the reason is that those, those combinations here are also the ones, are, let's say, are closely connected to the ones that enter uh, tadpole conditions in vacuum amplitude. So you, just by computing one loop vacuum amplitude, you can somehow read off this, uh, this factorization, which was a nice, well, which, which helped, helped us a lot in this, in this discussion. Also, let me briefly mention that this anomaly polynomial, uh, if, if, you, if you just take this anomaly polynomial and you, and you and you play the KSV, the KSV game using this anomaly polynomial, you can see that you can see that it breaks down. Namely, you cannot find, for instance, you can find a Keller form which verifies all expected conditions with this uh, anomaly polynomial. So it seems to be a, an anomaly polynomial that, that has to be associated to a non-supersymmetric model. And yeah, from the string perturbation theory, it's, it's actually, uh, well, you can just realize that some of the fields are not cannot be embedded in supersymmetric models, but this is a more, let's say, a more general statement. Okay, so let, let me go back to the, to the main story, which is of testing the behavior of string defects. So again, I will consider just the D1. Again, we could have rub D5 or anti-D1 and so on, but let me just focus on the D1 brain. So we can put it again, either in the bulk or the fixed point of, of the T4 here. Again, we have different spectra. We have, diff this time we have different anomaly polynomials, so different charges. And in particular, the charges are not the same anymore. The, for instance, the Q, like the, the norm Q square here and here is different. Uh, we can again compare what's, what would be expected from the KSV formula, this eight and this zero here to, to the actual central charge. So now there's nothing because the, there's not, nothing from the gauge group from the champ pattern factors because it doesn't change when the, the, brain, the brain gauge group does not change when you put it as a fixed point with respect to when it is in the bulk. However, you still have the possibility of having those massless states, which, um, which, st which stretch between the, the D1 and the D5 and the anti-D5. Uh, in the bulk, you have something different. Oh, sorry, let me just say also that, that here you see that you see that the conditions of KSV also break down here because of this plus sign. This would have been predicted to be minus if, if this was a BPS string. This is related to the fact that these states here have, a, have, a, have the, wrong, the wrong chirality. 
the, the Kasmodi algebra of this K group is realized on the, on the wrong carriality, and this is tied to supersymmetric breaking is and, and is also a violation of the KSV constraints. However, something interesting happens when you put the D1 grain in the bulk. In the bulk, when the D1 grain then is separated from the entire D5, what you get is exactly the result that would be expected from, from KSV. So these 20 and these six would be that what we would get from the KSV condition, which are different from this eight and this zero here, simply because the charge is not different. So here it seems that the KSV conditions apply to this grain in the bulk because it's, it's um, separated from the source of supersymmetry breaking. So yeah, this, this is a, well, this repeats what I just said, namely that non-BPS stable grains generally violate the conditions, which could be expected. Actually, I did not mention it, but you could already reach this conclusion in the supersymmetric model just by looking at the anti-D1 or just or looking at the uh, D5 brain wrapped around the D4 with the wrong, with, for instance, with an anti self dual um, you know, magnetic field. So this could have been expected actually. So we just uh, confirm it in, in those tests. But something interesting is that the D1 grains separated from supersymmetry breaking do not violate the conditions. And, and actually, there is a, a, last, a last thing I would like to, to mention, which, which is motivated by, by the nature of this, of this string in the bulk that we discussed in both cases, which is a null charge string conjecture. So in both cases, which we discussed, the, this, uh, this, this given Polchinski model, which was a SUSY model in this brain supersymmetry breaking one, in both cases, we had bulk brains which verified the case, which verified the KSV constraint, and in particular, they had null charges, namely the Q dot Q was equal to zero. And actually, this is very generic. In, in well, this is this is expected in geometric compactifications when you have a 10D understanding of of, of the theory, because then you have brains and 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 two tensor multiples which descend directly from the one in 10 dimension, and and if you if you if you consider the brains which, which are those brains which descend from 10D, then, then they have naturally, they do not couple to the, to the twisted tensors and they naturally verify this condition. But actually we realized that it's more, more general. And in all models we checked in the literature, even ones which are not obviously geometric or models which are just derived in F theory, uh, it seemed that those charges were always present when we could work out the, the, the brains explicitly or that they would be allowed according to the KSV formula. So this motivated us to, to propose this null charge string conjecture, namely that there should exist a consistent string, so a string that passes all consistency tests with the addition, additional condition that it should be a null string. Uh, unless, of course, you have zero tensor. So if you have zero tensor in the in, in zero tensor multiples in the theory, there's uh, just a single tensor, and you cannot, and this is strictly positive by definition. But in all models with at least one tensor that we check, this seems to, this seem to, to exist. And if you assume this, well, it turns out that you can exclude 6D supersymmetric models, which had no string theory or F theory realization, but which could not be excluded using the KSV constraints. So let me give you two examples that appeared first in this paper by Kumar Morrison and Taylor. Uh, the first one is, an, is one tensor with an SUN gauge group with one sym symmetric and n symmetric and n minus eight fundamental hypermultiples. In that case, you can work out the anomaly polynomial and the vectors A, B. So here they are. I won't Show you the details, but what you can check is that using uh, this lattice and this this these charges, you see that the most general null charge, which has this expression q plus or minus q, ne will never fulfill the KSV constraint. And the same happens for another model of again one tensor and gauge group S224 times SO8 with three anti-symmetric hypermultiples with respect to the first group. And then you can also work out the, the different vectors which enter the anomaly polynomial and check that the bond are null charge never fulfills the KSV constraint. So if you take this uh, conjecture seriously, those would be excluded. Mm. So for instance, this one was constrained by anomaly considerations or by the KSV uh, condition, but here using this constraint, it seems that it is excluded for any n. Okay, this, this brings me to my conclusion. So we perform experimental tests of the KSV conditions in, in the form of just looking how they are realized on the, the known brains of supersymmetric or non-supersymmetric oriented folds to, to 6D. And here are the general comments, uh, the general results that, that, that we found. So first of all, as, as, I, as I discussed, BPS brains can have non-minimal central charges, even the simplest one. And non-BPS stable brains generally violate the conditions as expected. However, the D1 brains, which are separated from the source of supersymmetric breaking in those models do not. 
And, and we also saw that some anomaly polynomials, like the one in, in this uh, brain supersymmetry breaking model, cannot arise from the supersymmetry model simply because they violate the KSB constraints. And so finally, we proposed a null child string conjecture that allowed us to exclude models without uh, a known string or FT realization. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention. Great. Let's all thank Quentin for his very nice talk using our emojis. Um, while we wait for questions, uh, let me ask one. So the, when you separated the D1 and D5 bar, you found that these uh, KSV conditions were still satisfied. I was a little confused why those things could just sit separated and there wouldn't be like some attraction between them. Like, is there some tadpole that is not being canceled? Uh, no, I think I, I think I think the brain can can sit here without. Yeah, I, I think there, it's okay. I think it's not attracted towards the D five bar. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think Yinan has a question. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder if there's an upper bound on the total number of D1 brains, or is a is a number of D1 brains this choice finite or not? Uh, in that case, well, in, in that case, for example, they are not constrained by tadpole constellations. I mean, they are they live in the 6D. I mean, there is enough non-compact directions to to make. I mean, there, there's no tadpole tadpole constellation on those D1s that we consider. Mm. Um, so, so from this side, there's there's no constraints. Um, yeah. Oh, so you get like an infinite landscape. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you start packing some, then you change the gauge group that you have, and then yeah, it's, the story changes a bit. Just not an, an addition of what I just said, but indeed, I think there's no there's no obvious bound on this. Okay. Uh, Ethan. Uh, hi. Um, so did you, I'm sorry if I missed it, but uh, did you have some sort of uh, physical um, motivation for this null string conjecture, like something to do with throwing things in black holes or anything like that? No, no. I've just, so, so far, our, our motivation is really well, observational in those models because, so in, in these geometrical models, as I said, we have this uh, understanding from the fact that there are brains which descend from the 10D. And, and no, our, the, the major motivation was just that we checked all models we could, and, and we saw that it would still, it, it, it seemed to hold. But no, we don't, we, it would be good actually to have something else than just this uh, like brute force scan of, of, of models for, for this conjecture, yeah. No, but we don't, we don't have this for the moment. Uh, thanks, yeah, very interesting though. Yeah. And Ivana? Yes, hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice talk. I uh, was wondering if you could play this game uh, for um, non supersymmetric cases from for brace of brain supersymmetry breaking cases um, explicitly in the Sugimoto model where the brain Susi breaking happens on uh, anti denying brains. Yeah. So you have, for instance, the one and the five brains, uh, which would be BPS, but they you know, you cannot separate them from the anti denying So I was wondering if you could play this kind of game with those. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, you, you could you could uh, run the same kind of arguments. We, I, uh, I remember we looked at that originally, but I, I would have to check. I don't remember the, the, the results, but uh, yeah, I think you could, you could do that. But as you say, as you said, there's no abuse separation here, so. It, yeah, and not right? only that, but like the, the vacuum itself doesn't really work as a as a flat Minkowski space. True. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, yeah, you have those uncancelled dead ports anyway. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. that's, that's something else, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, so if there are no other questions, let us thank uh, Quentin again.